Yes. Oops. Um, I'll just record from here. Okay. Uh, name three different techniques ATC uses to manage traffic congestion. The delay, uh, delayed flight program. Yeah, ground delay program. Ground delay program. That's what it's called. Holding. Yeah, holding. Holding's a last resort, though. But yeah. Minutes in trail. Yeah, miles in trail. Yeah, miles in trail or minutes in trail, but. And then separation, like they uh, regulate speeds and uh, altitudes. Yeah. Yeah, that'd be more miles and trail, but yeah. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff on there. You also could have done like ground stops, um, different routing, um, airspace, airspace flow programs. There's a lot of stuff you could have put there. What's the max takeoff weight for our beautiful CRJ 700? 75,000. 75,000, yep. What is the max landing weight? 67,000 with 90% of the time. Yep. What is the max zero fuel weight? 6250. 62,300. I think it's 62,300, yeah. Name the three different sources of power. Um, backup, primary, backup, auxiliary, emergency on this 700. The IDG, uh, yep. the APU is your secondary, and your ADG yep. is your uh, last resort. <laughs> yep. Name the four primary flight controls of the CRJ-700. The ailerons, rudder, um, elevator, and uh, multifunction spoilerons. Correct. Yep. How many hydraulic systems are there in the 700, and how many pumps does each system have? It's three uh, hydraulic systems with two pumps per system for yep. a total of six pumps. Yep. What areas of the 700 are anti-ice using bleed air from the engines? All the leading edges. So your, your wing leading edge, your vertical um, wing stabilizer, and your engine cowls. Yeah, so, le um, so leading edge of the wings and the engine cowls. Uh, and then also remember the electrically ones are the windshield and your um, pedo static. Oh, yeah. What are the two primary functions of the APU? Leader to or start the engine. Yeah. And then power the auxiliary systems on the ground when the engine's not running. Yeah. So yeah, power and then engine start. What stage of the engine are used as the source of bleed air? Six and ten. Six and ten. All right. So we'll start talking about some weather here. Let me get up to the top.
Okay. So we'll start out with kind of talking about some atmospheric pressure, altimetry, um, things like that. I'm going to send out a quick link to a video here. Go ahead and pop that up and give it a look-see. I'm going to turn my mic off here. Just one second.
All right, everybody finish up with that one. Yeah, I'm done. I thought that was a total curveball when I first watched that video when he was like, we're flying from Dallas Love to Arkadelphia. He could have picked anywhere else. It almost makes you think he's he might be like from Arkadelphia or something. So if the if AWOS or ATC always updates our altimeter setting, uh -huh. why do we need to learn about and it affects everyone uniformly? Why why does it matter that the pressure changes it? Why do we need to learn about that? Um it's gonna be I mean, pressure indicates a lot of, like, what our weather is going to be. So we kind of just need a general understanding of how it's going to affect weather and how it's going to affect our plane and how it flies. There are actually a fair amount of uh, approach charts that still say, I think Jackson Hole is one of them, that you're not allowed to descend... Like, it changes our minimums if uh, we don't have the local altimeter setting. Like, a good pilot would update it every, like, 10 or 15 miles or so. Yeah, well, the thing is, is we actually don't... So as soon as um, a lot of, like, scheduled carriers get up to 18,000, they just change it to 2992. And then if they don't change it back, they can end up really, um, I mean, you can play wrong if you're trying to descend to minimums. And then if you're like 100, 200 feet off, you can end up crashing into the runway. That makes sense. Yeah. So let me see. I thought Jackson Hole was one of them. Guess not. Let me see. Now I'm going blank. I thought I knew a couple. I'll see if I can find some tomorrow, and then um, I can email you guys out the uh, the airport that it has them. But it's kind of cool just because it'll say, like, right there in the... It's like if it were on this... Some of them say different things, but some of them, like up in the notes, it'll say um, not authorized unless you have the local altimeter setting. Um, so if the altimeter is out, then that runway or that approach goes completely out, like you just can't use it. So it still, it still affects us, um, even though, yeah, like you were saying, most everybody changes, like, I mean, even general aviation, when you're flying at, like, just a few thousand feet in a little puddle jumper, everyone changes it, like, all the time. Um, but with larger airplanes, like with our CRJ-700, as soon as we get up to 18,000 feet, we'll change it to 2992, just so that we're standard with everyone else up there, so that we don't have to keep changing it.
All right, sorry. Tomorrow though, and uh, send it out and show you. <clears throat> Basically, we're just talking about atmospheric pressure and how it's going to affect our um, readings on how high we are. Like he was saying, high to low, look out below, or hot to cold. Um, if you go from like a high pressure area to a low pressure area or a hot area to a cold area, your altimeter is going to read that you're still higher than you are. And then you'll, you may think that you're higher. And then when you're coming down, you could end up, if it was like foggy or something, <clears throat> and you came down and you thought you were at, you know, 400 feet above the ground, and then really you were at 200 feet above the ground. It can end up changing a whole lot for you, especially if you're doing like a cat too. Okay, the atoms and molecules that make up various layers in the atmosphere are always moving in random directions. Despite their tiny size, when they strike a surface, they exert pressure. Each molecule is too small to feel and only exerts a tiny bit of pressure. However, when we add up all the pressure from large number of molecules that strike the surface each moment, the total pressure is considerable. This is air pressure. As the density of the air increases, then the number of strikes per unit of time and also an area also increases. So this is just like we were talking about how our performance with our engine, uh, we increase when it's cold because there's more air molecules going through the engine. And then if it's hot, our pressure is decreased and there's less air going through there. So a barometer is basically a measure of what the pressure is in the air. Um, the instrument Torricelli designed to measure pressure was called a barometer. The aneroid barometer is the type most commonly used by meteorologists and aviation community. This is basically what it is. Essential features of an aneroid barometer are a flexible metal cell and a registering mechanism. Air is taken out of the cell to create a partial vacuum. The cell contracts or expands as pressure changes. So think of it almost as like a balloon that has a constant pressure in it, and it's going to either expand or contract um, based upon what the pressure of the air is, and then this needle is going to read, in a sense, how big or how small it is, which is a measure of the pressure. Atmosphere, atmospheric pressure units. Atmospheric pressure is expressed in a way throughout the, in many ways throughout the world. Meteorologists worldwide have Long measured atmospheric pressure in millibars, which note pressure is a force per square centimeter. However, after the introduction of the International System of Units, 1960, the hectopascal was adopted by most countries and is used in the Aviation Routine Weather Report, METAR. Aviation Selected Special Weather Report, SPECI. So, METAR and SPECI. Most meteorologists prefer to use the term they learned during their education or experience. Therefore, some continue to use the term millibars, while others use hectopascals. The unit inch of mercury is still used in the United States for altimetry. So there's like a whole bunch of different things. Um, most of the time, what you'll see is this here, what they're talking about in the METAR in SPECI, the hectopascals. Or you'll see inches of mercury. So this is kind of where things start to differ a little bit with pressure. So station pressure is the pressure measured at an airport um, or actual pressure at field elevation. Pressure is lower at higher altitudes, therefore airports with higher Field elevations usually have lower pressure than airports with lower field elevations. For instance, Denver and New Orleans. So New Orleans is at sea level, and Denver is the Mile High City. Um, this is kind of what we were talking the other day, where we get better uh, performance out of our engine um, at lower altitudes because there's more air 
So we can probably take off with more weight in a shorter distance at New Orleans than we can at Denver. Although New Orleans is going to be, well, they're both super hot during the summer, but just typically because of the amount of air and the pressures, so one's at sea level and one's very high, we're going to be able to take off at a shorter distance with more weight at New Orleans than we are with Denver. So pressure variation, atmospheric pressure varies with altitude and the temperature of the air, as well as with other minor influences such as water vapor. So somebody was asking about uh, how humidity affects us. I'll actually go into that a little bit later. So clearly, pressure is going to change with altitude. We're going to have more air down here, and we're going to have less air up here. So as we move upward through the atmosphere, the weight of the air all above us decreases. If we carry a barometer with us, we can measure a decrease in pressure of the weight of the air above us, or as the weight of the air above us decreases. So we have a whole bunch more air above us down here than we do up here. So clearly the pressure of the weight pushing down on us is going to be a whole lot less up here at the top than it is down here at the bottom. So temperature effects on pressure. Like most substances, substances, air expands, it becomes warmer and contracts as it cools. Um, this figure down here shows three columns of air, one colder than standard, one with standard temperature, and one with warmer than standard. Pressure is equal at the bottom and top of each column. So think of these as like expandable cubes. And these both started out as the one in the center, and they cooled the one at the bottom, and it contracted to produce that. So it's still the same pressure as this one. And then this one was heated up, and it became this. So it expanded, but it still has the same pressure. So these molecules are just moving a whole lot faster, and they're farther apart. So you have vertical expansion of the warm column has made it taller. Contraction of the cold column has made it shorter. Since the total pressure decreases in the same, since the total pressure decrease is the same in each column, the rate of decrease of pressure with height in warm air is less than standard, while the rate of decrease in pressure with height in cold air is greater than standard. So it's basically just saying this one's cold, it's going to be smaller and it's going to decrease. This one's hot, so it's going to increase. Those are all three the same pressure. Sea level pressure. Since pressure varies greatly with altitude, we cannot readily compare station pressure between stations at different altitudes. To make them comparable, we adjust them to some common level. Uh, mean sea level is the most useful common reference um, in this figure here, um, pressure measured at a station at a 5,000 foot elevation is 25 inches. Pressure increases with one inch of mercury per thousand feet, or a total of five inches. Sea level pressure is approximately 25 plus 5 or 30 inches mercury. So that's just kind of giving you a standard unit of pressure increase. Sea level pressure analysis, so a surface chart. After plotting sea level pressure on a surface chart, lines are drawn connecting points of equal sea level pressure. These lines are equal pressure are isobars, hence surface chart is an isobaric analysis showing identifiable organized pressure patterns. Four pressure systems are commonly identified, low, high, trough, and ridge. I'll actually pull one of these up here in a minute. So a low is going to be characterized by this red L, 
um, a minimum of atmospheric pressure in two dimensions on surface chart or a minimum of height on a constant pressure chart, also known as cycl cyclone. So cyclone is just kind of referring to the way it's spinning. Um, if something is cyclonic, then it's spinning counterclockwise as long as you're in the northern hemisphere. <clears throat> so a high pressure system, the maximum of atmospheric pressure in two dimensions, so closed isobars on a surface chart or maximum of height closed contours on a constant pressure chart, also known as an anticyclone. So that's just going to go the other way. Anticyclonic would be clockwise in the northern hemisphere. A trough is just an elongated area of low pressure. And then a ridge is an elongated area of high pressure. So let me... I'm going to pull up WSI weather. So in this surface analysis, we can actually see a lot of these. Um, so high pressure, low pressure, you see these troughs. Um, I don't really see any ridges on here. These are fronts. But you can see that a lot of times these match up with where the fronts are because our pressure gradients are going to be, or our pressures are going to be different on each side of the front. Um, most of the time, a high pressure area is associated with good weather, and then a low pressure area is associated with bad weather. So a lot of times we can actually pull this up and look, and, and you can almost predict that uh, Denver is going to have a bad day if there's a big trough over here, because we're just going to end up having bad weather most of the time. I'll show you. Uh, here we go. So this is a jet stream, but this will just kind of show you uh, when we have these contour lines far apart. That means that the pressure or the gradient is like it's not high, but when the when they're all super close like this, it's going to be really high. Let me see if I can find the one on here. That's that one I'm looking for. The National Weather Service used to have a really good one, but I, I haven't been able to find it in a while. That could be totally user error, and it's just me, though. Well, you get the idea from the other one. <clears throat> this will show kind of a rough estimate. 
So when we have these uh, lines far apart like this, it's going to be a little bit greater, or I guess less of a pressure gradient. So these are far away, and that's only a difference of four. These are really close together, and that's a difference of four. So these all ones that are really close are going to be a greater change, whereas the ones that are farther apart, it's going to be a, a could be the same change, but just over a greater time. So that would be like a ridge, a trough. So a constant pressure surface is a surface along which the atmospheric pressure is equal or is everywhere equal at a given instant. For instance, the 500 millibar constant pressure surface has a pressure of 500 millibars everywhere on it. The height of a constant pressure surface varies primarily due to temperature. These heights can be measured in a Ron Sonde, which is just a weather balloon. So Ron Sonde uh, observations. Take routine scheduled upper air observations, usually referred to as soundings. So a balloon carries this instrument, which consists of radio gear and sensing elements. While in flight, the Ron Sunday transmits pressure, temperature, and relative humidity uh, data. Wind speed and direction aloft are obtained by tracking the position of this radio Sunday. Um, in flight using GPS. Most stations around the world take these observations. However, meteorologists and other data users frequently refer to these, the whatever is a radio sound observation. Um, This is basically what it looks like. Uh, there's actually a place by my house where they um, launch these things up in the air and they go fast. But they do this uh, quite frequently and then you're actually supposed to mail these little boxes back if you ever find one. It'll say on there, it'll give you directions like where to mail it back to, but most of the time they just never find them. But they just go up in the air and they transmit all this information back so that we have all the information of um, temperature, wind, pressure, everything like that all the way up. And the National Weather Service uses that to make a lot of these charts and also give us like a lot of real-time data. We can also get a lot of this data from planes that are going through the air. The... Uh, the place by my, well, this is my house back in Georgia where I grew up uh, that launches these. It's like a big National Weather Service thing. And it's at an airport that's just mostly general aviation. And so at this airport is this National Weather Service like facility. And they do all sorts of weather reporting and everything, but the airport does not have a TAF. It only has a METAR. It's kind of funny. There's a similar picture to the one I showed you, but this one looks like it's more from the 80s. Still using the same stuff. Just not as cool of hairstyles and pants. So constant pressure surface analysis and upper air chart. Um, these heights are measured by the, the balloon. Are um, plotted on a constant pressure chart and analyzed by drawing a line connecting points of equal height. These lines are called height contours. Um, first, consider a topographical map, which contours showing variations of elevation. These are height contours of a terrain surface. The Earth's surface is a fixed reference, and variations on its height are contoured. So it's basically the same thing, except just in terrain, it's measuring pressures. So, for example, 700 millibar constant pressure analysis is a contour map of the heights of the 700 millibar pressure service. While the contour map is based on variations in height, these variations are small when compared to flight levels. So, for all practical purposes, 
one may regard the 700 millibar chart as a weather chart approximately 3,000 3, meters or 10,000 feet above mean sea level. Um, the big one you'll, you would use um, for aviation as far as um, planning flights for our 700 is the 500 millibar chart. That's around 18,000 feet. And that's a lot of where our steering winds are. So most of the time when you look at there, that's going to be where everything is moving from. Let's see. I wonder if this is going to show it to us in middle. Oh. So, yeah, here we go. So this is the 500 millibar chart, and this is our jet stream. Different pressure areas um, and different storm systems. You can basically look on this 500 millibar chart, and if the upper level winds are supporting those pressure systems, then they can grow into being huge thunderstorms. So there was actually one day at work when there was a big low pressure system here and there was a front um, that indicated that it was a possibly a occluded front, which we'll learn about. And these winds completely supported it and we ended up having thunderstorms and just like just horrible weather over the Midwest for, it was like two or three days. They were bad days to come into work. So a contour analysis shows highs, ridges, lows, troughs, um, troughs aloft, just as the isobaric analysis shows such systems at the surface. These systems of highs, ridges, and lows, and troughs are called pressure waves. These pressure waves are very similar to waves seen on bodies of water. They have crests, valleys, and are in constant movement. So yeah, this 500 millibar, 18,000 feet, that's a big one for us. Um, 300 millibar, 30,000 feet. It's going to be a lot of where we're flying in here with our 700. Density is the ratio of any quantity of volume to the area it occupies. Atmospheric density is defined as a ratio of the mass of the air to the volume occupied by it, usually expressed in kilograms per um, cubic meter. So basically, density is mass divided by volume. So the uh, amount of air we have and the volume we have, the density. Volumes uh, effect on density. The density of an air parcel varies inversely with its volume. So if the volume goes down, the density goes up. So these have the same amount of air in them. Smaller volume, higher density. Higher volume, higher or uh, lower density. So in general, the density of an air parcel can be changed by changing its mass, pressure, or temperature. So this is Boyle's mm -hmm. Law. So mass, pressure, and temperature can all change density. This kind of ties into each other because when we're looking at this and we're talking about the amount of air or the pressure of the air or the temperature of the air, that can all change our um, like the pressure gradient and like the pressure that our altimeter is reading, things like that.
So density is directly related to pressure. Assuming constant mass and temperature of an air parcel with a higher pressure is denser than an air parcel with a low pressure. So down here, it's going to be a whole lot more dense than up here. So temperature's effect on density is pretty similar. Um, higher temperature, lower density. Uh, lower temperature, higher density. So the other day when somebody asked how humidity affects um, pressure and can affect maybe the performance of our aircraft. So the density of an air parcel is inversely related to its quantity of water vapor. Assuming constant pressure, temperature, and volume, air with a greater amount of water vapor is less dense than air with lesser amount of water vapor. This is because dry air molecules have larger mass than water molecules. So just like they were saying in the video earlier, um, what we have in our planes is this basically this aneroid barometer. Um, so when you start out your plane, you're going to have the um, altimeter set to wherever your the airport you're taking off at, and then. So most of the time, like when I'm sitting in the cockpit and we're flying from St. George to, let's just say I'm going St. George to uh, Salt Lake, even though that's a 200, but we're just going to pretend it's a 700. So I'm sitting in there. They're going to set their altimeter to the local setting so that they're know in reference to the altitude that they're flying um, to all the other planes in the area. So everyone's got the same altimeter setting. And they do this so that you don't have a different altimeter setting than somebody else and you think you're flying at 5,000 feet and they think they're flying at 5,000 feet. And then all of a sudden you guys like um, are like 100 feet in altitude, 200 feet in altitude above or below each other. So you know where everyone's at. But then as soon as they get to 18,000 feet, everyone changes their um, altimeter setting to 2992, which is just standard. And then when you're coming back in, you would change it back down to your local setting. Okay. So with our altitudes, we've got a couple different kinds of altitudes. Um, so true altitude, since existing conditions in a real atmosphere are seldom standard, altitude indications on the altimeter are seldom actual or true altitudes. True altitude is the actual vertical distance above mean sea level. If an altimeter does not indicate true altitude, what does it indicate? So it indicates your indicated altitude. It shows the effect of mean temperature on the thickness of three columns of air. Uh, pressures are equal at the bottom and tops of the three layers. Since an altimeter is essentially an aneroid barometer, um, altitude indicated by the altimeter at the top of each column would be the same. To see this effect more clearly, basically the hot one is going to indicate 10,000 feet, and even though it may be 11,000 feet. So in warm air column, a pilot would fly at an altitude that is higher than the indicated altitude. If the cold air column, the pilot would be flying at an altitude lower than the indicated. So even though these are all indicating 10,000 feet, their true altitude is going to be higher in hot air, be the same in standard, and then actually lower in cold air.
So height indicated on the altimeter also changes with changes in surface pressure. The movable scale on the altimeter permits the pilot to adjust for surface pressure, but he or she has no means of adjusting altimeter for mean temperature of the column of air below. Indicated altitude is the altitude above mean sea level indicated on the altimeter when set at the local altimeter setting. So the altimeter setting. Since the altitude scale is adjustable, a pilot can set his or her altimeter to read true altitude or some specified height. Takeoff and landing are most critical phases of flight. Uh, therefore, airport elevation is the most desirable altitude for a true reading of the altimeter. The altimeter setting is the most or is the value to which the scale of pressure altimeter is set to. Wow, this is a mouthful here. The altimeter setting is the value of which the scale of the pressure altimeter is set to. So the altimeter indicates true altitude at field elevation. Basically, you just set it so that it indicates the actual uh, field elevation. So to ensure the altimeter reading is compatible with altimeter readings of other aircraft in the vicinity, a pilot must ensure the altimeter setting is correct. He or she must adjust it frequently while in flight according to the nearest surface weather reporting station. As he or she flies from high pressure to low pressure, the plane is lower than the altimeter indicates. All right, we're gonna get down to wind here and then take a break. Let's see if I can knock this out in eight minutes. So corrected approximately true altitude. If a pilot could always determine mean temperature of a column of air below the aircraft and the surface, uh, flight computers would be designed to use this mean temperature in computing the true altitude. However, the only guide a pilot has to temperature below him is free air temperature at his altitude. Therefore, the flight computer uses outside air temperature to correct indicated altitude uh, to approximately true altitude. The corrected altitude is indicated altitude corrected for the temperature. So pressure altitude is the standard atmosphere sea level pressure 2992 inches of mercury. Absolutely, you should know what standard altitude is. Um, that should be something you should have memorized. So 2992 or 113.2. Pressure decreases at a fixed rate upward through the standard atmosphere. Therefore, at a standard atmosphere, given pressure exists at any specified altitude. Pressure altitude at, uh, is the altitude shown by the altimeter when set to 2992. So when we're setting our altimeter to 2992, um, whatever altitude we're showing is the pressure altitude. So therefore, when flying at a specified pressure altitude, constant pressure service, a pilot's true altitude will change with distance. However, since the pressure altitudes are flown at or above flight level uh, 180, a pilot will almost always have, be above the highest terrain features. So once we're above that, we're not really worried about it because that's going to be above um, most terrain features. So that's why we basically do that and it makes it a whole lot easier for the pilots. Density altitude is the pressure altitude corrected for temperature deviations from the standard atmosphere. So density altitude bears the same relation to pressure altitude as true altitude does to indicated altitude. Density altitude is indirectly related to atmospheric density. As air density increases, the density altitude decreases. Airports with higher field elevation have lower pressure, lower density, and therefore higher density altitudes than airports with lower field elevations.
So down here, density altitude is an index to aircraft performance. Higher density altitude decreases performance. Lower density altitude increases performance. So high density altitude is a hazard since it reduces aircraft performance in the following three ways. It reduces power because the engine takes in less air to support combustion. It reduces thrust because there's less air for the propeller or the fan to work with, or a jet has less mass of gases to force out of the exhaust. It reduces lift because the light air exerts less force on the airfoils. So there's going to be less air going around our wings. We're going to have less lift. You should definitely understand those three things. So a pilot cannot detect the effect of high density altitude on his airspeed indicator. The aircraft lift off, lifts off, climbs, cruises, glides, and lands at a prescribed indicated airspeed, but at a specific, specified indicated airspeed, the pilot's true airspeed and ground speed increase proportionally as density altitude becomes higher. Okay. All right, let's come back at eight o'clock and hopefully we can make it through a lot of this stuff a little quicker. How's that sound? Eight o'clock? Sounds good. Eight o'clock sounds good. Cool, cool.
right, is anybody still watching that? Cool, cool. So pretty much all weather comes from uneven heating of the Earth's surface. And a lot of that is going to be changing because of wind. Um, so wind is named for the direction it's blowing. So like she was talking about, the easterlies, westerlies. Um, also, we always talk about wind and the direction it's coming from. So wind at 360 at 15 knots is 15 knots of wind coming from 360. So coming from the north. Zero nine zero at fifteen knots would be fifteen knots of wind coming from the east. So we always talk about wind as where it's coming from. Um, primary forces that affect wind are pressure gradient, the Coriolis force, and friction. So pressure gradient force is driven by pressure differences, which create a force called pressure gradient force. Whenever a pressure difference develops over an area, the pressure gradient makes up the wind, or makes the wind blow in an attempt to equalize pressure. So when we have a high pressure system and a low pressure system sitting next to each other, the high pressure system is going to blow into the low pressure system uh, to try and equalize them. So pressure gradient force is directed from higher height slash pressure to lower height and lower pressure and is perpendicular to contours and isobars. So when we have a lot of these contours and isobars, it's going perpendicular to those. And the closer they are together, the faster the wind is going to be. So wind speed is directly proportional to pressure gradient force, which itself is directly proportional to the contours and isobars gradient. So closely spaced contours and isobars indicate strong winds, while widely spaced ones, lighter winds. So this is going to be really strong winds. These are going to be very light winds. The Coriolis force. We got another sweet video. This one's a lot shorter. Um, Coriolis is actually really cool. Very interesting. Uh, this video kind of gives you a pretty good idea about it. So watch this one, and then we'll be back in just a few minutes.
Is anybody still watching that one? What was the hurricane that hit uh, Puerto Rico last year? Actually, this will work. Irby or Irvine or something? What'd you say? Like Harvey or Irwin or something like that? Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It might have been Harvey. Um, this one will work, actually, for what I need. So let's pretend this one's Harvey. And so if you guys have noticed the track of hurricanes, they always start coming from this direction or from down here. And they end up coming up here. And it always seems like right around the time they hit Florida, they start to curve back to the right. And I used to always think this was just because they followed the curve of the land. But a lot of it actually has to do with the Coriolis effect because they're actually curving back this way. That's why when we get the big hurricanes that come through the Gulf over here, So they always come here and they curve back. So that's why when we get the ones that come through the Gulf, they don't come here and then follow the land. They get up here and they end up curving back over through Georgia. And they follow this Cor Coriolis effect. They get everything gets pulled to the right. So not only is everything getting pulled to the right like the wind, and that's what makes it spin, um, this counterclockwise, but it also makes the entire system curve to the right. So as it's coming up, it's going to the right. That's why all these big hurricanes always do that. I always thought that was the coolest thing. Maybe that's just like weather nerdy, but... Right, right. There we go. So the Coriolis effect, a moving mass travels in a straight line until acted upon by some outside force. Um, basically what it's saying is everything goes to the right in the northern hemisphere. So it's because of the spinning of the earth. So when they were talking about that um, paper airplane, it's because Texas is spinning faster than the, the states north to it. And... So Texas is spinning faster than all these states north to it. So when you throw this, it still wants to spin with the earth just as fast, so it gets pulled off to the right. You know, one thing I thought was really weird is that no matter which direction wind is blowing in the northern hemisphere, it always bends right. If yeah. It's blowing west, yeah, today it to goes right. If it's blowing south, it goes right. If it's blowing east, it goes right. Yeah. Most of the time, though, we end up with the jet stream. Our jet stream is almost always going. So if we look at this, it's always blowing. So over the United States... Um, when she was, when we saw those zones earlier, oh, that one's later. So yeah, what is really cool is like everything as always travels like over the United States always travels west to east. And then these winds are always traveling east to west. And then these over here too. Yeah. So it always, everything gets pulled off to the right. But yeah, even up here, it would still get pulled off to the right. Most everything would die off by a, the time it got up here, though, because it's just too cold. But yeah, yeah, it is really cool. It's really interesting.
the weather stuff is my favorite. Um, if dispatching were the same as winter, like all year long, I would get so bored. Um, I love dispatching in the thunderstorms. It just is so much more exciting. Yeah, so like this is saying here, um, the pencil is going to get pulled off to the right. So Corio, the force deflects air to the right in the northern hemisphere and to the left in the southern hemisphere. So Coriolis force is at a right angle to wind direction and directly proportional to wind speed. That is, as wind speed increases, Coriolis, Coriolis force increases. At a given latitude, double the wind speed and double the Coriolis effect. Um, Coriolis force varies with latitude from zero at the equator to a maximum at the poles. Um, if influences wind direction, or it influences wind direction um, everywhere except immediately at the equator, but the effects are more pronounced in middle and high latitudes. So it's not going to be affecting as much right around the equator because most of that is spinning at the same speed. But then once we start to follow the curvature up, uh, is where we really see the, the change in force. So friction force is another one of those that we talked about with wind that can affect wind. Friction between the wind and terrain surface slows the wind. Um, the rougher the terrain, the greater the frictional effect. Also, the stronger the wind speed, the greater the frictional, or the greater the friction. So if you're going over mountains, trees, uh, things like that, you're going to come across friction. But this is going to be very low level wind. This isn't going to be like your like the steering winds that we were talking about at 18,000. So how she was talking about like global winds and then lower level winds on that video earlier, this would be more like lower level winds. It's a smooth terrain and the wind can just blow like crazy. Um, we end up with a lot of really strong winds um, out west um, over the desert. Sometimes we're going to end up with super strong winds actually um, just like randomly in different desert locations. So the frictional drag of the ground normally decreases with height and becomes insignificant above the lowest few thousand feet. So this is the this is like lower level stuff. So upper air wind in the atmosphere above the friction layer, only pressure gradient force and Coriolis force affect the horizontal motion of air. Remember that the pressure gradient force drives the wind and is oriented perpendicular to height contours. When the PGF is first established, wind begins to blow from higher to lower heights directly across the contours. However, the instant air begins moving, Coriolis effects the Coriolis force deflects it to the right. Soon the wind is deflected a full 90 degrees and is parallel to the contours. At this time, Coriolis force exactly balances the pressure gradient force. And with the forces in balance, wind will remain parallel to the contours. This is called geos geostrophic winds. So with pressure gradient force, the wind starts out going across um, you know, from higher to low, and then the Coriolis force is pulling it to the right, and it eventually, when these two equal out, it'll be going parallel.
So surface wind. At the surface of the Earth, all three forces come into play as frictional force slows the wind speed. Coriolis force decreases. However, frictional um, force does not affect pressure gradient force. Pressure gradient force and Coriolis force are no longer in balance. So here, in a low pressure, high pressure, so high to low. Um, so we have pressure gradient force pulling this way, Coriolis pulling this way, and the wind actually going this way. So then we have friction starting to act on it, pulling it back this way. And then what kind of happens is it'll hook around this way. So this is basically just kind of like a look at same thing up here. So if we have high and low, they want to start crossing. And another thing will get pulled to the right. Polar cell. Air rises, diverges, and travels toward the poles. Once over the poles, the air sinks, forming the polar highs. So air sinking, so air is pushing down on the earth, so that's what creates this high pressure. So think about like you're at the surface of the earth and you're looking up and you're holding the pressure, like you've got your hands up in the air and you're holding the pressure out and this air is pushing down on you. So that's a high pressure. Low pressure, the air would be moving up. Uh, so between each of these circulation cells are bands of high and low pressure at the surface. The high pressure band is located around uh, 30 degrees north and at each pole. Low pressure bands are found at the equator and 50, 60 um, degrees north or south. Usually fair, dry, hot weather is associated with this high pressure. So here in Utah, um, if you look on a map, there's almost always high pressure above us. And that's why we have such beautiful weather. So the jet streams. Jet streams are relatively narrow bands of strong wind in the upper levels of the atmosphere. The wind blows from the west to the east in the jet stream. So, this one. So the west to the east. Well, actually the jet streams are a little different, but. Um, jet streams follow the boundaries between hot and cold air. Since these hot and cold air boundaries are most pronounced in winter, jet streams are the strongest for both the northern and southern hemisphere winters. So direction of flow. Um, why do the jet stream winds blow from west to east? As stated in the previous section, if the earth was not rotating, the warm air would rise at the equator and move toward both the poles. The Earth's rotation divides the circulation into three cells. Likewise, the Earth's rotation is responsible for the jet stream. So an object's speed relatively, relative to the Earth's axis depends on its location. Someone standing on the equator is moving much faster than someone standing at 4 degrees latitude line. Um, so this is moving faster than this. And then this person up here would basically just be kind of like slowly rotating around. So the momentum of the air as it travels around the Earth is conserved, which means in the air that over the equator starts moving toward one of the poles. It keeps its eastward motion constant. The Earth below the air, however, moves slower as that air travels towards the poles. The result is that the air moves faster and faster in an easterly direction the farther it moves from the equator. So, in addition, with all three cell circulations mentioned above, the regions around 30 
and 50 to 60 are areas with temperature changes or areas where the temperature changes are the greatest. As the differences in temperature between the two locations increase, the strength of the wind increases. So therefore, the regions 30, 50, 60, um, or 50 to 60, are also regions where the wind in the upper atmosphere is the strongest. So we've got the polar jet stream that stays pretty north of us. Every now and then it kind of dips down a little bit, and you might see it in like Maine or New York. Um, this subtropical jet stream, uh, we see a fair amount. Uh, well, actually, this polar jet stream during the winter dips it way down, and we will sometimes even plan routes through it to get... Um, like a sweet tailwind and the flight times are way shorter and vice versa if we're going from the east coast to the west coast uh, our flight times are a whole lot longer so the region where the polar jet stream is located with the subtropical jet located from 30 degrees uh, jet streams vary in height from 4 to 8 miles and can reach speeds of more than 275 miles per hour. So the jet streams actually lower in altitude and also lower um, going further to the south during the winter. So we don't have much of a jet stream going right now. But if you looked at this chart, let's see, during the winter... Most of these big winds would be coming straight right across here and dip up, or sometimes they come down here and then dip up like that. Um, but you would see a huge jet stream basically like coming across here, and it would be like 100 knots or greater, whereas right now we're looking at you know, 50, 60 knots. Uh, most of our bigger winds are up here. That looks like maybe... 85, uh, looks like 90 coming down there. So most of our stronger winds are like further north. But it will, during the winter, it'll actually dip further down south. It'll like come down here. And the altitude will actually lower. Whoops. So if we looked up higher, now we're going to see a lot stronger winds. So the actual appearance of the jet stream results from complex interaction between many variables, such as the location of high and low pressure systems, warm and cold air, and seasonal changes. They meander around the globe, dipping and rising in altitude, uh, latitude, splitting at times, and forming eddies, and even disappearing altogether to appear somewhere else. Jet streams also follow the sun, in that, as the sun's elevation increases each day in the spring, the jet stream shifts north, moving into Canada by the summer. As autumn approaches and the sun's elevation decreases, the jet stream moves south into the United States, helping bring cooler air to the country. Also, the jet stream is often indicated by a line on maps shown by television meteorologists. The line generally points to the location of the strongest wind. In reality, jet streams are typically much wider. They are less a distinct location and more a region where winds increase toward a core of highest speed. Um, so sometimes we'll put, we'll try and put our planes going through these, and then other times. Uh, we won't, because sometimes it can actually cause a lot of turbulence. But it also is nice to kind of cut some flight time down. So if the wind is smooth, sometimes we put them through. Um, or sometimes pilots can kind of talk to ATC and, and get uh, a feel for what kind of turbulence they're going to be feeling um, up in these jet streams. And... Uh, just ride reports from other planes and they can kind of figure it out from there.
but it is really cool to get some of these big tailwinds all of a sudden they land like 30 or 45 minutes faster than they do during the summer or vice versa going from east to west it's a whole lot longer so one way of visualizing this is to consider a river. The river's current is generally the strongest in the center, with decreasing strength as one approaches the river's bank. It can be said that jet streams are rivers of air. So we'll go right into talking about local winds here. Local winds are small-scale wind fields, uh, systems driven by diurnal heating or cooling of the ground. Air temperature differences develop over adjacent surfaces. Low-level pressure gradients develop with high pressure over the cool, dense air, denser air, and low pressure over the warmer, less dense air. So when we have warm air, typically the warm air rises and creates this low pressure area. And then when we have cold air, this air sinks and creates a high pressure. And then when you put them together, they kind of create this big circular um, system. And typically this creates wind for us at low levels. So low level winds develop in the direction of the pressure gradient force. Uh, Coriolis force is inconsistent insignificant because of the circulation's dimensions. So this is small level stuff, less than 100 miles, and lifespan less than 12 hours. So local wind systems would be sea breeze, land breeze, lake breeze, lake effect, um, valley breeze, mountain plains, wind circulation, and a mountain breeze. So local winds can produce aviation weather hazards. Turbulence and shifting surface winds are common. Um, clouds and precipitation can develop in the rising air over the warmer surface given uh, sufficient moisture and lift. Um, this actually, we get a lot of this. Like coming in and out of St. George, the ground gets so hot that we get these little pockets of air that rise up from the ground. And that's why it's so turbulent coming in and out of St. George during the summers. And also, like, Las Vegas gets a lot of turbulence during the summers, too, just because of the same thing. But if you flew in first thing in the morning when everything's still cool, just smooth as can be. So sea breeze, like she was talking about in the video, um, land will heat up. Um, I guess a, a whole lot faster than the water will. Water takes a long time to heat up. So this air over the land heats up, rises, moves out, uh, cools off, sinks down, and then the cool air that's over the water um, shifts in to help replace this air that's moving up. And so we end up with this breeze coming off of the ocean. So we got cool water out here. Uh, it's cooling the air, shifting over here. We got hot, um, the land is heating up. We have hot air, it's shifting up. It's getting replaced with this cool air, and it's going in a circle there. Air above the land becomes warmer, less dense than air above the water. So, sea breeze front. Um, is the horizontal discontinuity of the or in temperature and humidity that marks the leading edge of the intrusion of cooler moisture marine air uh, associated with a sea breeze if often produces a wind shift and enhances cumulus clouds along its leading edge cumuliform clouds may be absent if the air mass being lifted over land is dry or stable um, so with this front, a lot of times we can see fog because, so like, 
this is one of the things that you would associate with this would be let me pull the map real quick For the left, I'm up. Okay. So as you can see, we have a lot of flat land right here on the coast of Georgia and Florida. Um, so, well, actually a lot over here too, Tallahassee, Panama City, Destin, Mobile over here. Um, so sometimes in the morning when the sun comes up and this land starts to heat up, Works a little bit better over here. Uh, so when this land starts to heat up and we do get one of these sea breeze fronts, sometimes we can bring this cold air in. And then it's so humid down here in the southeast that then we change the temperature and the temperature dew point uh, to where it might end up just creating this cold air comes in and it, it takes that humidity and it can just turn into fog. And then all of a sudden a lot of these like east coast airports can end up seeing a lot of fog. Um, because of something like that. So I know that seems like a very insignificant thing, like, oh, we have a light breeze coming off the ocean, but sometimes that can actually affect us a whole lot. Because when we start talking about fog, then we start talking about, you know, do we have to have an alternate? Uh, do we maybe want to leave some hold fuel on? Or, or add some hold fuel on, um, things like that. And are we going to be able to land in there? Um, you know, is the breeze strong enough that we can't land on? Maybe if there's an airport that only had one ILS and the airport runway wasn't set up for that wind direction. It's a lot of a lot of ways that this can affect us. So effects of coastline shape. Locally, the shape of the coastline plays an important role in the development of convection along sea breezes. A narrow peninsula or island is generally an area of a strong convective development during the late mornings or early afternoons. This is because the sea breeze formed along opposite shores merge near the peninsula's or island's center. So what they're talking about is like, where everything converges here. So where we see this actually is we see a lot of thunderstorms coming from right here. This, so this water coming up in here and then this water over here by Pensacola. And then we end up with a lot of convective activity like right here. Um, and then it can affect our Mobile and Pensacola markets. Uh, at SkyWest, we fly to both of those, and those are things you have to start thinking about in the afternoon. 
um, when those thunderstorms start kicking up. Convergence occurs, occurs where sea breezes merge from opposite directions. Stronger lift may be sufficient to initiate showers and thunderstorms if the air mass is sufficiently moist and unstable. So a land breeze is almost the exact opposite. So a land breeze is a coastal breeze blowing from land to the sea. So like we were talking about here, um, how she was saying in that video, uh, the air over this water is going to stay warmer longer. This water is going to stay warmer longer, and so it's going to heat up that, that air and shift it up. And then our land is going to cool down a lot faster, and that cool air is going to move out toward that. And we're going to end up with this land breeze, this, this, this breeze blowing from the land. So just like how we were talking about um, how our wind is always named, So a land breeze is a breeze coming from the land. A sea breeze is a breeze coming from the sea. So lake breeze is a local wind that blows from the surface of a large lake. So this we might see like out, uh, um, this is a, a big thing out like by the Great Lakes. And basically the same thing. Uh, both occur during the warm season, primarily spring and summer. Both are easiest to detect in light synoptic wind conditions. So this is especially true where breezes uh, from adjacent lakes collide. We get a lot of thunderstorms um, up by New York as well. Because we have the lake breeze. And then we also have the sea breeze coming from the other direction, if it gets that far. So a valley breeze. A valley breeze is a wind that ascends a mountain valley during the day, so it goes up the mountain. So a valley breeze, a breeze coming from the valley. Air contact with the slope. Uh, terrain becomes warmer, less dense uh, than the air above the valley. This is because the air in contact with the slope terrain heats up faster than the air um, above the valley. That's because that's a terrible picture for it. But I'm going to draw over this stuff. So if we have our mountain here, and then we have our valley, and then let's just, you know, we get this little hill over here, whatever. So then we have our sun slowly coming up. So at first our sun's going to be hitting nothing, and then as the sun comes up, it's going to start kind of glancing off of our um, our ground here, but it's mainly going to already be shining against our mountain face, and as it gets higher, it's going to receive even more heat from this and then this is you know just now going to start being heating up so the face of our mountain is going to see the sun way before this bottom land will that's why it's heating up so may did everybody get that So yeah, this heats up, this air on the mountain heats up, and it rises, 
and so um, it's going to cool and then it's going to come down in the valley and it's going to push that cool air um, up toward the mountains. So we have this mountain or this this valley breeze coming from the valley up to the mountains. So mountain plains wind system. A mountain plains wind system is the diurnal diurnal cycle of local winds between a mountain or mountain range and the adjacent plains. During the daytime, this wind system is equivalent of one half of a valley breeze. Air in contact with the sloping terrain becomes warm or warmer than the air above the plains. This is because an air in contact with sloping terrain heats up faster than the air above the plains. So pressure gradients develop with lower pressure over the warming, uh, warmer sloping terrain and higher pressure over the cooler plains. Winds develop in the direction of the pressure gradient force. Thus, the winds blow from the plains up the mountain slopes. So sometimes with this lifting effect, we can end up with um, some rain or even thunderstorms up there, but these big uh, cumuliform clouds. So a mountain breeze, just like a valley breeze, is a breeze flowing from the mountains. Um, as you can imagine, instead of in the morning, this happens at night. Air in contact with the sloping terrain cools faster than the air above the valley. Pressure over the sloping terrain is higher than over the valleys. Cooler air over the sloping terrain is denser than warmer air over the valley. So it's just the opposite of a valley breeze. Okay, so heat and temperature. So temperature is one of the most basic variables used to describe the state of, of the atmosphere. We know that the air temperature varies with time from one season to the next, both between day and night, and even from one hour to the next. Do you guys know what the coldest part of the day is? An hour after sunrise. Um, yeah, it's just after sunrise. Yeah, well done. Okay. Um, so that's actually when we see a lot of fog happen is right after the sunrise because then all of a sudden the temperature drops like maybe even a degree or two and it'll be just enough to, to snap that um, air cold enough to see fog. So a lot of times people think if there's fog already out like overnight, they'll think, oh, well, as soon as the sun comes up, it'll burn it off. Well, it will but there's going to be a delay. So as soon as the sun comes up, we're actually going to see it get a little bit colder before it gets warmer. So matter is the substance at which all physical objects are composed. Energy is the ability to do work. Heat is the total kinetic energy of the atoms and molecules, so our matter, composing a substance. The atoms and molecules of a substance do not all move at the same velocity, but thus there is actually a range of kinetic energy among the atoms and molecules. So temperature is a numerical value representing the average kinetic energy of atoms and molecules within matter. Temperature depends directly on the energy of molecular motion. So how fast are those molecules moving? Are they moving super fast? So we're going to end up with warmer temperatures. Are they not moving very fast at all? We're going to end up with lower temperatures. Temperature is an indicator of the internal energy of air. Temperature measurement on the thermometer. Um, we have multiple temperature scales. Most scientists use the Kelvin scale, which is thermodynamic or absolute temperature scale where absolute zero, the theoretical absence of all thermal energy, is zero Kelvin. Thus, the Kelvin, scare, the Kelvin scale is a direct measure of the average kinetic molecular activity. 
because nothing is going to be colder than absolute zero. Celsius is really what we're going to be using in aviation. So this is what our METARs and species are in. Um, the scale most commonly used temperature is scale worldwide in meteorology. The scale is approximately based on freezing point of zero and a boiling point of 100 under a pressure of one standard atmosphere. Each degree on the Celsius scale is exactly the same as a degree on the Kelvin scale. So heat transfer is going to be the transfer of energy. So from one thing to another, we're transferring energy, and that's basically just going to be heat. So if we're transferring it in radiation, so if you stood in front of a fireplace or near a campfire, you have felt the heat transfer known as radiation. The side of your body nearest the fire warms, while the other side remains unaffected by the heat. Although you are surrounded by air, the air has nothing to do with the type of heat transfer. Heat lamps that keep food warm work in the same way. Um, radiation is the heat transfer of heat energy through space by electromagnetic radiation or electromagnetic radiation. So solar and terrestrial radiation, all objects emit radiation energy, including the sun and the earth, and objects wavelength or maximum uh, radiation is inversely related to its temperature. So hotter objects emit a shorter wavelength, whereas cooler emit a longer wavelength. Conduction. Conduction is the transfer of energy by molecular activity from one substance to another uh, in contact or through a substance. So heat always flows from the warmer substance to the colder substance. So it's always warmer to a colder substance. So technically cold is just the absence of heat. So if you think about, I don't know if any of you guys have ever used those ice packs for uh, like athletic stuff where they just like you like crack the corner of it and this chemical reaction takes place uh, within the bag and all of a sudden the bag gets cold. It's not that the bag actually gets cold, that chemical reaction just sucks up all the heat from around it so that if you place it on your skin, it would just suck up all the heat from your skin. So the rate of heat transfer is greater from or with large temperature differences and depends directly on the ability of the substances to conduct heat. During conduction, the warmer substance cools and loses heat energy while the cooler substance warms and gains heat energy. So conduction is from one substance to another. All right, you guys are going to need to memorize this table. That was a joke. Sounds like everybody's already asleep, though. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. I'll take it. Convection. Convection is the transfer of heat within a fluid, such as air or water, via motion of the fluid itself. This type of heat flow takes place in liquids and gases because they can move freely. It is possible to set up currents within them. So boiling water in a pot is an example of convection. Because air is a poor thermal con uh, conductor, convection plays a vital role in the Earth's atmospheric heat process. So conduction is from one thing to another, whereas convection is within itself. So thermal response, whether by radiation, conduction, convection, or a combination of these, the temperature response to the input 
of some specified quantity of heat varies from one substance to another. Specific heat capacity, also known simply as specific heat, is specified as the measure of heat energy required to increase the temperature of a unit quantity of a substance by a certain temperature interval. Don't worry too much about that. Water has the highest specific heat capacity of any naturally occurring substance. That means it has a much higher uh, capacity for storing energy than other substances. So we were talking about that the water for our sea breeze, water takes a lot longer to heat up. But it also holds on to that heat a lot longer. Whereas air and land heat up a lot faster. Temperature variations with altitude. A lapse rate of temperature is defined as decrease in temperature with height. As it is stated that the temperature decreases um, 6.5 degrees Celsius in the standard atmosphere. So this is basically just showing that um, over the different seasons, um, places can heat up more than others. I didn't realize how hot Kansas City gets. So atmospheric sounding, um, or simply sounding, is a plot of the vertical profile of one or more atmospheric parameters, such as temperature, dew point, or wind above a fixed location. Um, so basically, think of this as like one of those weather balloons, and the weather balloon is just heading straight up in altitude, and it's sending us messages back about temperature and pressure. So an isothermal layer is an isothermal an isothermal layer is a layer within the atmosphere where the temperature remains constant with height. So most of the time here you're going to be decreasing temperature with height and then sometimes there's an isothermal layer where we don't decrease at all. It just just remains the same for a little bit and then it starts decreasing again. So a temperature inversion um, is a layer in which the temperature increases with altitude. If the base of the inversion is at the surface, it is termed a surface-based inversion. Surface-based inversions are typically bad weather. You, I mean, it's like foggy, just it's just crap. Um, if the base of the inversion is not at the surface, it is termed an inversion aloft. Um, surface-based inversion typically develops over land on clear nights when wind is light. The ground radiates and cools much faster than the overlying air. Air in contact with the ground becomes cool, while the temperatures a few hundred feet above uh, changes very little. Thus, temperature increases with height. An inversion may also occur at any altitude where conditions are favorable. For example, a current or warm air aloft overrunning cold air near the surface produces an inversion aloft. So this would be a surface-based inversion where we might be 15 degrees at the ground and then 20 degrees um, up here a little higher, a couple thousand feet. And then the temperature decreases as it should with um, altitude. And then it actually increases again, and this would be our inversion aloft. All right, we've got cloud video. Check that one out, and we'll be back when it's done.
right. Uh, is anyone not back with us yet? They're still watching. How can we answer for not back? Uh, well, I figure people still be listening. <laughs> I don't know. That's a good, uh, good point. Um. So water vapor, water vapor is a gaseous form of water and one of the most important of all constituents in, of the atmosphere. Um, it can, constitutes only a small percentage of the Earth's atmosphere. Basically water vapor is what's going to make up our clouds and precipitation. Um, the hydrologic cycle. The hydrologic cycle involves the continuous circulation of water in the Earth's atmosphere. Um, water vapor plays a critical role in the cycle. So we have evaporation, um, condensation, transpiration, precipitation. Evaporation is the phase transition in which a liquid is changed to a vapor. So when water evaporates from a lake, it, it goes up into the air and, and creates this water vapor moisture in the air. Primary source is the ocean. So transpiration is the evaporation of water from plants. And in most plants, transpiration is a passive process largely controlled by humidity of the atmosphere. Sublimation is the phase transition of which solid is changed into vapor. We don't really see that that much. Um, sublimation of water would be uh, ice or snow changed into water vapor or gas. Condensation is the phase transition in which water vapor is changed into a liquid. Um, condensation would appear as clouds, fogs, mist, dew, or frost. Um, transportation. Transportation is the movement of solid, liquid, and gaseous water through the atmosphere. Precipitation um, is when ugh. precipitation results when tiny condensation particles grow through collision and coalescence. Runoff. Runoff occurs when there is an excessive precipitation and the ground is saturated. This runoff flows into streams and rivers and eventually back to the sea. Infiltration is the movement of water into the ground from the surface. Groundwater flow is the flow of water underground in aquifers. So water flows underground in these like underground rivers and um, eventually it all goes back to the ocean. Saturation. Saturation is the maximum possible quantity of water vapor that an air parcel can hold at any given temperature and pressure. Once it's saturated, it will precipitate. Relative humidity is the ratio usually expressed as a percentage or... Sorry, that's my cat. Um, relative humidity is the ratio usually expressed as a percentage or water vapor actually in the air parcel compared to the amount of water vapor the air parcel could hold at a particular temperature and pressure. Dew point is the temperature an air parcel must be cooled and at constant pressure and constant water vapor pressure to allow the water vapor in the parcel to condense into water. That's a big one. When the temperature is below zero degrees Celsius, it is sometimes called the frost point. So, temperature that air must be cooled to at a constant pressure um, and constant water pressure, water vapor pressure, uh, to allow the water vapor to condense into water. So this is basically like if we're at a constant pressure and constant water vapor pressure, how much does it have to cool for us to create a cloud or create a uh, fog or mist or um, what we're looking at for our condensation up here. So, our 
Our temperature dew point the difference between an air parcel's temperature and its dew point at the dew point depression, or commonly referred to as the spread. So in our dew point, our dew points can be expressed as a temperature. Um, so if our dew point is like 10 degrees Celsius and our temperature is 10 degrees Celsius, our temperature dew point spread is going to be zero. So when the spread decreases to zero, relative humidity is 100% and the air parcel is saturated. So sometimes when you see, um, so Sacramento is like really notorious for this in the winter. Sometimes right before the sun comes up, you'll see the temperature and the dew point spread is like one degree. So if the temperature or if the dew point is 10 degrees and the temperature is 11 degrees, well, we already found out that our temperature is coldest right after the sun comes up. So the sun comes up and we drop our temperature to 10 degrees. And then our temperature dew point spread is zero. A lot of times we end up with really thick fog there. And that's one thing that you have to watch when you're dispatching flights um, before the sun comes up there because they may not be predicting any fog at all, but you have to look at that temperature dew point spread to see is there maybe going to be fog. And a lot of times if the temperature dew point spread is between like, I don't know, two or like one degree, then chances are really good Sacramento during the winter is going to have really bad fog as soon as the sun comes up. I think I've already talked about a situation where I didn't do that and that was my, when I was flight following, I told the captain what had happened and we came up with a plan. I think we diverted immediately, but Change of phase is when water goes from one state of matter to another. So solid to liquid, liquid to vapor. Latent heat is the quantity of heat energy either released or absorbed by unit mass of a substance when it undergoes a phase transition. All right, with five minutes left, we're going to take our best shot because a lot of these are pictures. Although, honestly, we could go on for clouds, about clouds, for like hours, probably. Um, clouds are super cool, and the moment you go jump seating and you see clouds, all these clouds from like 30 to 36,000 feet above the air, and you're looking down on them, and you can like pass by a thunderstorm cloud and you see the hail like spewing out of the top of it. It's they're pretty cool. They're uh they're much more fascinating when you're watching them from the air and also a little more scary. But um clouds are really cool. Cloud is a visible aggregate of minute water droplets and or ice particles in the atmosphere above the earth's surface. Fog differs from cloud only in that the base of the fog is at the Earth's surface while clouds are above the surface. Clouds are like signposts in the sky that provide information on air motion, stability, and moisture. So there are certain clouds that you see and you want to avoid like the plague when you're flying through the air. One of them is those lenticulars. And we actually see these on the mountain right by St. George all the time. This is an insane picture of some. I almost wonder if that's real. Most of the time when you see them, uh, like sometimes we'll see one like this out over the mountain in St. George. I don't think I've ever seen one that looked that perfect, but I've seen similar. They basically look like little contact lenses up in the sky. 
and they're they're associated with a lot of turbulence. Um, same with our cumulonimbus, our thunderstorm clouds. Clearly, you don't want to fly through those. So cloud forms. So high level clouds that form between twenty uh, form above twenty thousand feet are usually composed of ice crystals. It's going to be really cold up there. High level clouds are typically thin and white in appearance, but can create an array of colors when the sun is on the horizon. Um, that is going to be our cirriform. So cirrus is going to be really high. Nimbus clouds are typically our rain clouds. These clouds typically form between 7,000 and 15,000 feet and bring steady precipitation. Um, as the clouds thicken and precipitation begins to fall, the base of the clouds tends to lower toward the ground. Cumuliform clouds are super white and puffy, and typically there is some sort of rising motion in them. Um, otherwise, they wouldn't get that high. And part of our rising motion is one of the things that we actually need to build a thunderstorm. We need some sort of lifting motion. So a lot of times you get big thunderstorms, that's where these are coming from. Uh, the level at which condensation and cloud formation begins is indicated by a flat cloud base, and its height will depend upon the humidity of the rising air, so that rising factor is what's building these up so high. The more humid the air, the lower the cloud base. The tops of these clouds can reach over 60,000 feet, um, especially you see over the Midwest. Some of these things with thunderstorms, I mean, it's... They're huge. So big over Oklahoma. I mean, we see them with tops over 60,000 all the time in Oklahoma during the summer. Whenever there's thunderstorms, um, Oklahoma, Nebraska, sometimes blowing off of Denver out over the uh, uh, Midwest. Um, stratiform. A uh, layer or blanket, the cloud consists of features of low layer that can cover the entire sky like a blanket, bringing generally gray and dull weather. So this would be like your overcast layers. Um... I just, I don't want to rush through this stuff. I think I am going to tell Garrett we left off on clouds. And he'll be with you tomorrow, and hopefully he can get through the clouds with you. I just, this is, the clouds are pretty important, and um, these will kind of build on each other for the rest of the weather section. So I think we'll stop here for tonight. And I'll have Garrett go over the clouds with you tomorrow. Does anyone have any questions over anything we went over today? Anything before clouds? Or anything about clouds? Okay, so I grew up in Seattle. Okay. And the clouds are completely different there than here in St. George. Yeah. Like so, completely. You don't see the end of rain like you do here. Like that was not a thing there. So here um, we're going to have more of these like – so we have more heat coming off of the ground. So we're going to have a lot more of this rising motion. So you're going to see when we have clouds here, they're going to be more this cumuliform cloud. Um, whereas up in Seattle, you've got that kind of constant rain mist. Um, there's not very many thunderstorms up there because part of the, one of the things that you need for thunderstorms is you need some sort of lifting and rising factor. So you're not going to get these big cumuliform clouds. You're going to stick with more like the Nimbus. Um, there's going to be a lot of stratiform clouds up there. And then up above where you can't even see, there's probably, you know, I would assume there's going to be more some um, cirriform clouds. 
And actually, if we look at, if I can find a METAR, let me see real quick here if I can. Let me get the TAF too. We can even see our base heights. So when we're looking at this here, did I type in KATL? No. Okay, so I mean we've got one 4,000 feet. So when we're looking at 4,000 feet, and this is a broken layer, so this is going to be covering most of the sky. That, I mean we're looking at probably um, this Nimbus layer, which is going to be pretty low. Um, as clouds thicken and precipitation begins to fall, uh, I mean, this is going to be probably, I would assume, you're looking at more of a nimbus layer with that lower layer. And then as we get up higher, you know, 10,000, 25,000, that 10,000 layer might end up being another nimbus layer. And then I'm betting the 25,000 layer would probably be like a seriform layer. Or um, actually, the stratiform, maybe that real low layer, that 4,000. Um, yeah. Yeah. So we're, the clouds are going to be really different. Another thing that you'll actually see here that you will not see in many other places in the country is Virga. I actually didn't believe this was real until I... Um, moved out here so these big rain yeah, that's what I'm saying. like I never saw that before uh, yeah and then so, this is this is rain and it evaporates before it ever even hits the ground so down here you can smell the rain it feels like rain but there's no water hitting you and that absolutely baffled me when I first moved to st. George uh-huh same yeah so you get a lot of different clouds in different parts of the country um, I think we end up with a lot of like really cool clouds out here in Utah just because the mountains can help form those clouds and we also get a lot of rising factors coming from that heat coming off the ground. So we get some pretty cool clouds out here and once in a blue moon when it does storm. But uh, yeah, it's going to be very different stuff. I way nerd out on this stuff. And then... Um, also, when we look at last thing, and then we can, you guys can go if you if you need. But I'll show you this, which is kind of cool. If my computer loads, I'm going to have to restart my computer again so that it goes faster. I need it to load. Okay, so if we look at these, I mean, you can kind of see where it's like National Forest here. I'm hoping that it's going to come up with anything. Well, I'm I'm I want this satellite view that's supposed to pop up down here. Oh. So that I can show you the the mountains. Okay. 
It's going. <laughs> so it's super cool. As you can see, these big mountains up here. So what we get is all this weather is moving from west to east. So we get this, you know, a lot of uh, evaporation coming up off the ocean out here, and we get these big rain clouds. And um, so then they want to move west to east, so they want to move over here. We'll see with this big mountain range, those, I mean, that 4,000-foot cloud layer is not going to make it over these. These are way taller than that. So to get over that, these clouds, think of these clouds as like almost having like, they're, they're smart. So they have to, they know they have to drop their lower layers off to be able to make it over these mountains. So to do that, they just rain. And that allows them to lighten up to make it over the mountains. So that's why you get so much rain along here and so much snow. I know somebody always likes referencing, they want to go snowboarding up in Oregon, um, <laughs> up here. So that's why you get so much snow and so much rain up here is because all this uh, moisture filled air starts moving across and then it creates this cloud layer and that cloud layer has to do something because it's not going to make it over the mountain. It's just going to run straight into the mountain and it's going to end up raining down. So when you look at this, you can actually see this is green and lush and I mean, it rains a lot all through here. And then you have this mountain range, and then all of a sudden over here, it's very brown. Mm -hmm. And it's brown because most of the rain drops off over here. And then you have these really high level clouds over here. And then they don't pick up any moisture until they get you know further on. So there's really not much rain that goes on over here. So that's kind of also why. interesting yeah so that's that's pretty cool but all right well i'll have garrett go over um clouds you guys tomorrow and i'm kind of mad that was like the most interesting thing we had to talk about today <laughs> but uh does anybody else have any questions or anything i'm all good here all right. have a good night well, cool. thank you yeah y'all have a good night Thank you.